Good evening, everybody, and welcome to all the participants who've joined us for tonight's webinar and also to the viewers who are watching the recording. Uh, MHPN would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and you participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to Elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I'm Steve Trumbull and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. I'm a general practitioner by training, but my day job is as head of medical education at the Melbourne Medical School. At this moment, I'm meant to be in a small uh, Aboriginal community in the Northern Territory as a GP, but unfortunately I'm a Victorian, so I'm here in Victoria, but uh, not for much longer. We've got a great panel tonight. Uh, I won't be going through each person's background in detail, because you've seen that in the invitation. But uh, we have Simon Holliday, who's a general practitioner in New South Wales, Catherine Kitzmer, who's a physiotherapist in Queensland, and Michael Nicholas, who's a psychologist based in New South Wales. Just to touch quickly on a few ground rules to make the webinar go well, please be respectful of other participants and the panelists. Uh, you'll see each other's comments in the chat box. We see those as well. Uh, and uh, so please, it's a good place to communicate, but try and keep on topic for tonight's uh, webinar. If you have any issues with technical problems, then please do click on the uh, support tab. It's a frequently asked questions support tab, or there's a phone number listed there that you can ring for help from the help desk. Now, this panel, sorry, this um, platform, hopefully many of you are familiar with, to access the chat box, which I just mentioned, uh, click on that purple button to open that up. If you have a question, please do use the blue button uh, and enter your question there as concisely as you can make it. We have had lots of questions uh, ahead of tonight's webinar and we've tried to consolidate those, but things will come up while the panellists are talking you want to ask about, please pop those in the question box there. There are lots of resources available for you tonight, so they will be available along with the slide set from the light blue download button, so click on that. Don't forget there is the help button, uh, the yellow help button, so if you need assistance, you can message Red back directly or ring that number there. Now, the way things will go tonight, it's following our usual format that uh, you've seen the case that's been circulated. Each panelist will give a short discipline specific presentation about the work they do relating to that case, and then we'll engage in questions and answers and discussion between the panel. So that's the time that we'll want you to have submitted some questions that we can respond to. The learning outcomes are there, and I'll run through those very quickly, but they are important. The first one, to identify associations, comorbidities and patterns of treatment seeking behavior of people experiencing chronic pain. Second one, describing tips and strategies that can assist someone experiencing mental health problems related to chronic pain. And thirdly, to demonstrate the importance of collaboration and appropriate referrals when supporting a person experiencing mental health problems related to chronic pain. MHPN is all about collaboration between health professionals. As I say, you've seen the some, or you've seen the uh, case study. Jerry is a 56-year-old man who's familiar to all of us, I would imagine, with the sort of problems he's presenting. He's had years of low back pain, which was acquired at work and has been surgically treated, for better or worse, and he's also been on a range of medications, including codeine and benzos in that mix. He's had some physiotherapy several times, but he feels that his pain worsened following that, so he hasn't persisted with the treatment regimen prescribed for him. He's also tried some cannabis uh, out of desperation that a friend offered him. And he's also got some conflict going on in his life with his employers and their insurer, which is unfortunately so common in these sorts of cases. He turns up in our case for the first time at Simon's clinic. Simon is the GP. He's made his 15-minute appointment for a new patient and uh, he's there just for scripts and a repeat certificate doc. Uh, which uh, we all know is not going to be a quick consultation if it's done properly. Usually we start the discussion with the general practitioner to whom the patient presents or the client presents, but instead tonight we'll start with Michael Nicholas to give us a glimpse inside that consultation 
and maybe a look even inside the GP's head at the sort of conceptualisation of Jerry's case that Simon might be going through as Jerry tells him about his problems. So welcome, Michael. It's good to have you. Uh, as a psychologist, obviously, with a special interest in this area, so uh, please, if you could tell us about your thinking about what the situation is with Jerry. Right. Uh, oops, sorry. Right, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, so we're dealing with a chap with chronic pain, which is pain that's persisted for more than three months, but in this case, of course, several years. So it's definitely chronic. Now, uh, uh, the first uh, conceptual uh, aspect here is to realize that uh, there are multiple mechanisms likely to be operating um, in chronic pain, and particularly in this case of Jerry. There are biological contributors, um, and I've listed a few there, processes going on in the, in the nervous system, peripheral and central nervous system, uh, and changes that occur over time, like sensitization, uh, where small stimuli feel uh, much bigger than, than they really are. Um, the psychological contributors, uh, and I've listed a number there. I won't go through them all, but you can see a lot of those present in, in uh, Jerry. And then there's the social or, or environmental contributors, um, and I've listed uh, a number of the likely suspects there in, in uh, the usual case. So when I'm seeing someone uh, like Jerry, um, I've got to have all these different elements um, in my mind to think about how might those be contributing and I'll also be re relying on my colleagues uh, to actually also identify elements there as well so I don't have to identify them all myself um, but let's see how this might play out so um, in this case uh, uh, the, the pain is, is developed is um, we would say started off probably with tissue damage um, leading to pain, um, but as pain persisted, uh, then other mechanisms start to kick in, right, in the both peripheral and central nervous system, and that's where that sensitization starts to become uh, a contributor, uh, and other changes occur as well. And we believe they contribute to the maintenance of pain, so even after healing has taken place, the pain can persist. Um, and uh, it's also important to realize that he doesn't just have pain, it's impacting on his activities and it particularly stop doing a lot of things. And we all know when you stop doing things, um, that will lead to effects of disuse and so on. Um, and the feet, the lines, the arrows go both ways because when you're putting on weight, your joints are stiffer, you'll do less uh, and so on. And when you do try to do things, you'll aggravate your pain. Also, he stopped doing a lot of things he enjoyed that gave life meaning. So he starts to get depressed and get frustrated and so on, have sleep problems. Um, and, when, and then occasionally he gets fed up, so he'll then overdo things and aggravate his pain even, even more. But in addition, he, he has developed a number of beliefs about his pain. Uh, and these uh, may not always be very helpful and they may become part of the problem because they'll drive his treatment-seeking behavior. Uh, when we know that there really aren't any cures for his pain and that's often difficult for patients to accept and they'll keep having this experience of failure which compounds their dysphoria, their depression. Some of the treatments, of course, will contribute to the problems as well, particularly getting into more and more drugs and Simon will talk about that. But these interact um, with uh, what else is going on, particularly causing side effects which will contribute to his low mood his, uh, and sleep problems. Of course, there's been an impact on daily life, uh, work, his family, stress. He's more dependent on others, uh, financial stress, um, and so on. And he's, this is occurring in a context uh, as all pain occurs. Um, so he's got, for example, existing mental health conditions. He's got uh, healthcare providers who may not be giving him consistent advice, and that gets confusing. Employers may not understand that he himself lacks knowledge. He's got a friendly neighbor, but he may be actually leading him astray. And all these compound to cause excessive suffering and disability. So there's not always one thing going on with someone like Jerry. There are many elements, and these interact. But when you can develop a formulation like this, combining the biological, psychological, social, environmental factors, 
and share this with you. It's help, it helps him to make sense of what has happened and why he has ended up the way he has. Because it then leads to what can you do next. Um, and so these are the elements you've uh, assessed, remember. And then you go on there to looking at the intervention uh, based on what you find in your assessment. So you don't treat things that aren't there. So there's not a one size fits all. Your assessment would target your findings uh, 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 your, your treatment rather would target your findings from your assessment that you would also share with the other um, providers um, and we'll talk about that a bit later <clears throat> so for example in this case if you start on the left of that diagram just briefly there may be some interventions that will help the experience of pain it may include medication but also relaxation distraction techniques and so on but they won't solve the problem by themselves um, we also need to educate uh, Jerry uh, about his pain, help him get a better understanding of what's going on. And we need to identify some goals for, with him, things he'd like to get back to, things he'd stop doing and would like to get back to. And this will be where particularly the, um, the physiotherapy input will be in getting in an exercise program, not aimed at simply getting fit, but helping him to get back to functional activities that he wants to do. We'll also need to tackle his mood, both he may, as I said, press on pre-existing mental health issues, but also as a consequence of pain. Uh, he's like he's clearly become quite depressed and so on, and we need to address that. And we can address those um, those elements of sleep hygiene as well in a number of ways. Dealing with the medication that needs to be sorted out, and we'll rely on Simon to help us there to rationalise what he's on and. and and gradually reduce the things that aren't really helping. Um, because he's got different providers, we need to make sure that we're all on the same page. So we need to negotiate with them a plan and we need to bring the family in so they understand what is happening. And ideally, of course, the workplace and so on, um, if they're willing to cooperate, that will be important. Um, now, it may mean uh, he needs to make some changes at home and at work uh, in, in what he does and what his duties are uh, and he may swap uh, some activities with others, and that's something to be uh, sorted out. And because it's chronic, we need a maintenance plan. And so that's on the right end of that diagram. You'll see we need to help him look forward to um, what might happen. How would he deal with these things? So we need to equip him with skills to deal with the inevitable ups and downs and setbacks he will experience with his pain, rather than just going back to the medication what can we teach him to do that allow him to manage it himself? So I'll leave it there for now, and we'll carry on with, um, uh, I think it's Simon next. It is indeed, Michael. Thanks very much indeed for that. I think your diagram drew attention to the complexity of this presentation. The biopsychosocial model encapsulates just so much and this very complex person, Jerry. And so, Simon, Jerry's sitting across or sitting next to you in your consulting room. Uh, how are you going to approach uh, managing Jerry's problems? Well, uh, I must say uh, this is not going to be an easy appointment, especially because uh, running late is a characteristic of uh, many GPs that pay more attention to detail. So you're running late. <clears throat> And you've got to remember that the medical benefits schedule, which drives general practice, is not really funded for uh, a very careful psychosocial focus. We're more focused to fix the problem and fix the symptom. And so when Jerry says, or when anybody says, I just want a quick script, doctor, you can, you can have a bit of a heart sink feeling because you know that this person's health uh, conceptualization is about getting a script or a certificate and not much else so what I think number one job here is to buy time and uh, you need to say this is a really important problem we we're not going to be able to cover everything today but there's a, some really important stuff we've got to cover today and then you're going to start doing lots of things and uh, you'll need a history so you can understand what's going on um, and that's a general medical history as well a really important thing right at the onset for a general practitioner to do is to broaden the, the assessment from how bad is your pain out of 10 to doing an outcome measure. And one very quick one is a PEG score from Aaron Krebs. 
and uh, that can take 45 seconds for the first assessment and 15 subsequently and it gives you a good way of seeing how people are progressing when they when you first take people on often they're on bucket loads of uh, opiates and they're on bucket loads of benzos and everything else and they're a mess and they're really desperate for these painkillers it's the only thing that works it's probably very wise to try and contact the previous gp and find out um, what's going on and um uh, and get a handover and find out a bit about the opiates, even if you can get the um, GP to do the, uh, the script, because there's a whole lot of regulations about opiate scripts. It varies from state to state and territory, and a GP who prescribes opiates to the wrong patient can get in serious trouble. So it is a, um, a problematic area, and it's wise to talk to a GP previously. I think we need to... Um, engage with uh, Jerry and recognise that this guy is really distressed and he's probably very anxious whether he'll get his quick script and certificate or whether he'll be moralised about, looked down on his nose about, treated like with contempt. And he's already been through that with his workplace. He feels his work, his bosses have done the wrong thing by him. So he's got the, that injustice chewing away at him and that's, that's in the back of his mind when he comes to see us. We need to let him know that we know it's really important for him to be able to get back to work so he can get pay his house off and get the family back um, working again and how he's very focused on getting his pain control. One other thing we've got to really think about is suicidality. And uh, we know that people with chronic pain ho often have um, higher risks of suicidal uh, thoughts and also uh, people on opiates as well. So... In terms of management, um, I would be um, saying, rightio, uh, we've got to look more than your pain intensity. We do the PEG score. We'll contact the previous GP. We, um, we're going to be careful with the regulators in case we, get, we don't want to get pinged. Um, and um, we need to be comfortable about putting barriers around, boundaries around the opiates. And it might well be that you say, okay, I'm only going to, I haven't been able to catch the G, your other GP, but I'm going to give you enough medication for three days so we can start some, uh, buy some time and we can do maybe a urinary drug screen, whatever it is. And uh, that will allow you to have a double appointment and that will really change the way you manage Jerry. So the next slide is your second consult. So he's back after a few days. At this time, you're going to do a bit more of a physical examination and find out a bit more about his opiates. And the best way is, rather than using all the opiate risk measures, which are meant to uh, uh, work out whether someone is a, a genuine pain patient or a genuine drug addict uh, in a funny sort of moral binary, what you're best doing is just find out, tease, tease away, what is he doing in terms of uh, using a range of legal or illegal substances to feel better or to feel good and what's happened in the past. You might need to do investigations. However, GPs are prone to often over-investigate. It's a good way of putting a full stop at the end of a consult so you can get another bill. But we don't want to just send him on a, um, a pinball machine run through more CAT scans. So I think the second consult will be a great time to start some education and we'll be talking about his um, opiates and how opiates can actually create problems. They can even cause increased pain with sensitization. They can cause depression and they can worsen our sleep. We need to also talk to him about his benzodiazepines that he's on and how that they can imp increase the overdose risk, cause problems like um, dementia and also depress the sleep uh, breathing. We need to actually touch on how pain, chronic pain that he has isn't just like the pain you get when you burn your finger and you move your hand away, it's a quite a complex thing, as Michael's been saying. And there's so many parts of our brain and mind that are involved with pain. So then once you've gone through a bit of education, you can relate that education to how you're going to step forward with this guy. And it might well be that you, in that second consult, you start the idea of saying there are going to have to be other people involved because while we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about this stuff, you really probably need to have a bit more time talking about this fact that, uh, you know, you've said that if you don't get your painkiller, uh, everything's going to go to be a disaster in life. So there's some things you need to work through, um, and it would be good to see a psychologist, a physiotherapist, a dietitian, and uh, 
you might want to flag that, maybe give a phone number, contact the uh, workers' comp people, let them know that's happening. And then you'd probably start weaning the benzos quite quickly and arrange to have him back again. On the third contact, this time you'd organise your referrals. Uh, you talk, start talking about weaning on the opioids. You might look at some of these wonderful videos like Brain Man, and I've watched them many times with my patients. I still enjoy them. Um, and let, people, let him know that um, when he's having um, his um, opiates, that they are changing his whole nervous system, his whole mind, his, uh, many parts of his body, and that is affecting the way he uh, feels about his pain. You have to be aware that when you start to opiate taper, you, a lot of things will come up. Uh, people might start to go a bit chaotic. They might get aggressive. They might um, um, see other doctors. There's a whole lot of things that might come up. So you've got to be comfortable about all those sort of opiate behaviours and opiate-related opiate emotions and manage those. And that's the sort of skills you learn in addiction medicine. But I think people who are managing pain with opiates also need these sort of skills. So it might well be that you need to uh, increase the um, amount of supervision of each dose, that he has to go to the chemist more regularly, have shorter scripts, more frequent appointments. It might be that you think he's a risk of overdose because his uh, wife says that he's snoring at night and you might give him some take-home naloxone or rescue naloxone where uh, you put uh, naloxone up the nose, which reverses the opiate and um, stops people dying. And it might be that you're going to talk about um, uh, transition to a uh, opiate treatment program. In my experience for pain patients, that's pretty rare. Usually you can wangle through with just some more addiction-like strategies and get through it like that. But some people will need a methadone program or a buprenorphine program. And there's a really new um, formulation out called depot buprenorphine. And this is revolutionized, to my mind, problematic pain care because no matter how off the wall or on the wall, whatever, if people are getting their injectable buprenorphine, there's no diversion, they can't double dose, um, there's no argument, it's just so simple. But it, it is got the problem of long-term opiates, but all the chaos is uh, taken away. Finally, I think in the last um, uh, last part of that third consult, you, you find out how Jerry's spouse is going. Uh, you'd be looking at um, whether uh, she is helping him do his exercises or whether he's, she's wrapping him in cotton wool. And she herself could be depressed. She's had a hell of a time, and now she's not even in her own home. And you might also think about biological things, like there could be side effects between his cholesterol medication and his pain as well. Uh, the next consult, um, you'll be looking at more of these things a bit more Explaining to him pharmaceuticals aren't going to be the answer to his problem. We know that most pharmaceuticals aren't going to be terribly effective. Uh, we're going to be talking about, about his smoking, the tobacco, the cannabis, how that's affecting his mood, how it's affecting his pain. Um, how the fact that a substance might make you feel better, or if you take a bit more feel good, doesn't mean to say it's going to make your life a bit better. If you, you might say to him, look, stoners don't have really great lives. And so even though you feel better, it's not going to fix it. And you need to press on with the opiate reduction. Um, and we understand opiates have effects on the body apart from pain, including the hormone system, the immune system. Uh, and uh, so it is a massive impact on many parts of the body to be on opiates. And it's important that we keep moving on that. He, he will have insomnia because we've cut down his benzos. And so psychological strategies for insomnia are really important. It might be the psychologist will help with that, or some GPs are quite comfortable talking about bedtime restriction therapies uh, and sleep diaries. We'll also talk about his diet, not just his weight, but also the inflammatory diet and a healthy diet. All of these things fit in with chronic disease care anyway. And then we'll be talking about how he's going with his work and his home. And uh, if I may just say the last of, of the five appointments, just to give you an idea, by then we should have engaged with multidisciplinary care. It would be a great time to review with Jerry on this last, on this fifth appointment, how things are going. You've had a report back from the psychologist. You've had a report back from the physio. It's unlikely that you're going to be talking to these people because everyone's so busy. You might um, 
commentate on what the allied health people have said. Uh, you might repeat the PEG score to, and you'll find that despite the fact he's on a lot less benzos, a lot less opiates, that his, his PEG scores a lot better. You might need to go into bat for him with his insurer or his employer to, so that you can do an activity pacing style return to work uh, where it's um, uh, adjusted for his ability because being at work is a really good thing. We'll then be looking at um, some of the um, CBT aspects of what's going on for him. And also we have to remember that this guy still needs his biomedical care, his cholesterol, blood pressure, etc. And we'll be looking at those things as well. Thank you very much. Back to you, Steve. Thanks indeed, Simon. And two things you've said have really struck a chord with the participants. And uh, I know that they're in the resources, but you mentioned the PEG outcome measure. And also you mentioned yes. a movie. I imagined you sitting alongside your patient watching uh, classic Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise uh, movie from the <laughs> early 90s, but it's not Rain Man, it's Brain Man, I gather. It is Brain Man, and um, my apologies for my poor pronunciation. If you go to the Hunter Integrated Pain Service, I'm sure that um, uh, Julia will give you the links at the end. There's some wonderful series of Brain Man about pain and opiates and uh, and re rehabilitation for um, for people with a pain. And I also wanted to share with you this little um, uh, Charles Schultz um, cartoon about how a lot of pain management is not about doctors doing things to people. It's about um, quality of life and social reconnection. Wonderful. Thanks for that. I do intend to have my puppy on my lap by the time this webinar finishes, and I would encourage all participants to do the same. Uh, so thank you. That was really great, and we will have further conversation with you and uh, with Michael later on in the webinar. But for now, we're going to hear from our third speaker. Kat, you're a physiotherapist. Yes, that's right. I'm a pain physiotherapist, so I specialise in pain management. I must say that takes me by surprise because I've been a GP for a long time and I know physios have a lot to do with pain, but I've not actually come across one who specialises in pain management of this style before. Are there many of you? Yeah, there's actually not that many. There's, uh, there's only about 100 within Australia. Um, it is growing as a field, but it's only been really recognised over the last sort of four or five years. So it's definitely quite new, but hopefully we're making inroads into helping out in this area. Okay, well, great. Can you tell us what you would do or what maybe a more uh, middle-of-the-road physiotherapist might do in uh, managing a case like Jerry's? Yeah, well, unfortunately, we can see from his case already that he's had a few episodes with physio that haven't been very successful. And the most likely reason for that is that it's been more the traditional style of physiotherapy with the hands-on treatment. Um, when we're looking at uh, physiotherapy and pain management, it is really quite a different approach. Um, we've obviously got that bias towards the biological element of it. Um, we tend to look at how they are physically, how they're moving, how they uh, feel about how they move. But we're looking now in pain management a little bit more about um, their fears and their worries around movement how that integration of all the different things goes on with their social backgrounds as well. And especially when you've got work cover involved, there's so many elements to look at. So really, you know, one way of recognising it and thinking of it easily from our point of view is firstly to recognise that there are some other problems that need addressing. addressing. Um, respond in a way that takes note of the psychological impacts and not only the psychological psychological impacts on pain but also on pain on their psychology it's a two-way street and it's this is the hard part of it it's so complicated to, to tease out all these little elements which is it's why you need the team really it's not something that one person could do on their own um, listening for words and people like yourselves that work in mental health you're probably very good at this already uh, physios are probably the ones that need to work on this listening for those words that indicate a fear or a worry or a concern in some way um, and picking up on those and just making sure that we are not adding to the problem by using terms or picking our own beliefs into them and uh, about fears of, for example, for Jerry, he might be very fearful of lifting from here on in because of that. So that's something that needs addressing. With referral in that early period where he was seen by a physiotherapist, if they had managed to pick on, on elements that needed help, it would have been back to the GP 
and have that conversation about whether he needs a, another referral elsewhere. Important thing with this, as always, is just collaboration. So making sure every member of the team is giving the same messages and talking and, and helping Jerry out, obviously with Jerry at the centre of all this. Um, when I say team, I also mean, you know, family, friends. We've, we've talked a little about the influence of some of his friends um, and the work cover team as well as the GP and the medical team as well. When we're looking at it in a very distinct chronic pain management adverse to acute, so, you know, maybe we missed the boat in that first phase, so let's try again a bit later. We're looking at physiotherapist as a, as a guide to the physical elements. So things like um, self-management strategies and active strategies are actually really key. We use education quite a lot. Now, it really varies as to the level of education. So. Uh, there's been quite a lot of research on pain physiology education and it works for some people and it doesn't work for others. So we just have to pick what elements of education we're using. Um, when we're talking about getting them moving again, as Michael said, it's really important to look at their functional tasks, much more than a general gym program or anything where they're just getting moving. It needs to really be addressing what they want to be able to do. So for Jerry, you know, he's not going to want to do Pilates. He's going to want to get back to work. So lifting for him and, and just doing basic day-to-day -day tasks. Um, we look at grading or pacing up. So starting a very small amount of something and then gradually increasing that amount in a way that doesn't provoke or overstimulate his pain um, or just doesn't overwhelm him from any point of view. Again, just always collaborating, always talking, always going backwards and forwards with him and, and asking him how he's managing and talking to the other members of the team. Now, if you're really lucky like Michael, all the team are down the hallway and you can go and chat to them as you go. But most of us working in primary practice, uh, it's a phone call or a letter or some other way of contact. So just to kind of go over those bullet points again, it's really important that if you're working with a therapist, a uh, more physical therapist, osteopath, physio, anyone along that line, that you feed back to them where the patient is at from a psychological point of view, and that they feed back to you from a physical point of view so that you can use the things that you each know. So one of the things I've found really helpful is sharing strategies. So for example, I have a lady who starts to get her anxiety coming up when she does too much with the exercise. So I know what she's learned from her psychologist and we sit down and she goes through her relaxation strategies. So there's that bit of crossover. Now, we don't want to move outside of our scope of practice. That's very important. So we're not trying to be psychologists and I think we really need to be mindful of that, that we're not taking on things that we're absolutely not qualified to do. But if we know some of the skills they're using, we can just aid them with practicing those. Um, all facets of wellbeing are important and I always say to people, it's not just about work, you know, go do something nice, go for a walk on the beach, let's pace up your sports or activities. Now, I don't think Jerry is really into sports and activities, so it might be more pacing up his social activities. You know, why not go to the pub or go to a barbecue and try just a few little things? One of the main things is to everyone keep giving the same message. You know, pain is not harm, so it's okay to move and to get a little bit sore. Uh, Michael talked about managing flare-ups and that's quite important is that they know it does naturally happen that you will get a flare-up of your pain from time to time and this is how you can uh, manage it or just get yourself back under control. With the hands-on treatment, the type of information we were given about Jerry in that second half, that sensitivity, it just indicates that there's some changes to his nervous system. So he actually won't find the hands-on treatment helpful in the same way that someone in the acute phase may find it helpful. So there's not really a lot of uh, place for that at that point. Um, and that exercise and movement is just absolutely essential. And I know from your point of view that uh, you're often trying to get people moving as well because it's important for their uh, mental being as well as their physical being. So we like to keep it pretty simple. You can see this chap here just doing a plain old sit to stand. It's a really common movement. Everyone needs to do it at some point. So why don't we just practice something simple like that? Breaking the task up into different elements of it. So it's a bit of leg work, the forward lean, if there's any fear of kind of falling, et cetera. And then that pushing upwards. One of the things that's happening lately that is very good, uh, 
these groups that are appearing to help people. Now, you see that little picture there, the man walk, that's a new group that started around Australia and it is for men with mental health problems that want to get together and just have a, a non-judgmental talk and a bit of a walk. So it's not physically taxing. I think they take it pretty easily, but uh, just to have that support and have that, that walking together. There are lots of different groups and you just have to go on the internet to find your local ones. One thing I find quite important is just explaining to people um, some of the physiological changes they will get, especially with anxiety, are very similar to the changes that you get when you start exerting yourself, you know, getting a bit of a sweat on and a heart rate going up. So teaching people to be comfortable with those feelings and how to manage them. Um, <laughs> now, not everyone likes exercise. Uh, <laughs> Strange, but um, not everyone does. So I explain it to them that exercise sometimes has to be like cleaning your teeth. You might not love it, but you do it. And it's not just for now, it's for the future. So it's something you have to keep doing. Just every day, a little bit of something, whether it be a bit of cardiovascular work or a bit of strength work, or just practicing a certain activity that you want to be better at. So movement and exercise needs to keep happening. Um, now, to back you up, there are some nice online resources that you can use. Uh, the Exercises Medicine website is fantastic. And then there's some nice little, um, very similar to the Brain Man drawings, the 23 and a half hours. So have a look at those. I think they're listed with the resources at the end. But just to give you a quick outline of possible things we could have done with Jerry in the early system, education about pain and nervous system changes, setting a walking program, and this walking program for him may have started with, you know, a two minute walk and then pacing that up so that the time indicates when he should stop and not his pain. And, you know, maybe a 10 or 20 percent increase uh, once a week or a couple of times a week. Looking at self massage to desensitize and um, looking at strategies that you've taught them, helping them out or encouraging them to do it's probably more the point. And then later on, just pacing everything up nice and gradually, looking at movements that are feared and bringing those back in so that they're moving and functioning in as normal way as possible. Lovely. Well, thank you very much indeed. Now, I must say, as a GP, I had the pleasure of working in the same practice as an exercise physiologist, one of Melbourne's most um, uh, renowned exercise physiologist, I suppose. I've never been fitter. <laughs> so he was hugely <laughs> motivating, even for me. It was frightening. Uh, I had to change practices. I was exhausted. So he was hugely motivating. Can you just tell us a little bit about, there's been a few questions about the role of exercise physiologists and also OTs. Now, OTs are so central to mental health in so many ways, but specifically here with that physical aspect as well. Can you just mention a little bit more about your profession's view of uh, OT yeah, and well, exercise the exercise, yeah, I mean, they're both um, incredibly useful members of your team if you can have them. Um, occupational therapists tend to be a little bit better at the psychological stuff than physios. <laughs> That's just the fact. Um, and they, they do bridge that gap between uh, a lot of the time just very simple physical doing and the functional stuff. So they would probably err more towards the function. But having worked with an OT quite closely over the last year or so, um, there's often a lot of crossover. There's often not a lot of difference. So we found that we had to talk quite often and just really sort of separate out who was going to concentrate on what bits. So in the case where I was working with an OT, I might do slightly less functional and a little bit more of the more traditional style physio if she was doing more of the functional stuff. So it's, it's very helpful. Um, she would probably do a little bit more of the problem solving and the cognitive thought sort of challenging stuff, which again is probably outside the scope of most physios. Um, exercise physiologists, again, they would tend to maybe be a little more on the traditional exercise side rather than functional, but a, a good one will give exercises that build the functional movements and the functional tasks that allow that functional increase. So. I mean, if, and as I said, you know, from a physio point of view, if you've got an exercise physiologist, physio, osteopath, they're very similar in what they do. So all can be useful, definitely. Great. Thanks for that. There's also been a number of questions asking about if there's a register of um, uh, pain management physiotherapists. Is there a, a, an yeah, association that has is. a member list? 
Yeah, so Where do we find that? the Physiotherapy Association, APA. So if you Google uh, APA Physio, um, you can look on there and there's a list of what they call titled pain physiotherapists. So to get your titling, you have to work in the field and done further education and uh, other aspects of it. So, yeah, you can certainly find one locally by looking at that list. Great. All right. Well, thanks for that. So let's open up to uh, the whole group now and uh, we'll have some Q&A. There's been lots of questions uh, in the chat box um, or in the Q&A uh, section of the web site. So I'm just wondering where best to start. I'm, I'm going to go back to the beginning, actually, and think about the, the contribution of work and the employer to this. Now, I don't know if Simon remembers this too, but back in the day when there were lots more veterans around, I've never seen a group more antagonistic towards the Veterans Affairs Department than an injured veteran. And I see a little bit of that in the injured worker sometimes as well. It becomes almost a career or a, an obsession, I guess I could say, in fighting work cover and the insurer and the antipathy in the system seems to generate a lot of negativity. Michael, is that something that we can counter in some way? Uh, yeah, that, that's a, it's a good question, um, Stephen. I think um, uh, often it's blamed on the patient, uh, some sort of a problem they have. Um, but I would suggest uh, we look at uh, both the workers' comp and even veterans' affairs as a system. And I think the, the system actually that, that they are engaged with is uh, clearly part of the problem. Um, and we know that people with very similar injuries will respond differently according to whether it's a workers' comp case or, or not, for example. Um, and it's not because the workers' comp person is bunging it on. It's just that the workers' comp system puts a lot, a lot of extra pressures on you that the that normal Medicare doesn't. And, and in a way, for example, the workers' comp patient is basically asked to keep proving there's something wrong with them. Now, how do you get better if you've got to keep convincing some uh, anonymous person there's something wrong with you? Um, and uh, th this is a, a, a major challenge. And naturally, if people are stressed, if they have mental health issues, um, it can only exac exacerbate the problem. And um, it, it's very difficult. It's not like being in a maze for them. And they have a great deal of difficulty working their way through this. Um, and they may be dealing with someone who isn't very experienced on the, um, the workers' comp end of the insurer. Um, there's a high turnover of case managers because it's not a very nice job. Um, and so, um, and that's one of the most frequent complaints of injured workers is they, they have to tell their story a hundred times to different people. Um, so it, it is, uh, it's very important to see it as a system. And that's actually one of the things I've been researching to see if there are ways that we could uh, improve this. And indeed, I, I think there are. Uh, and that's one of my areas of research to show uh, we can train the workers' comp um, employees to uh, to behave in a more helpful way. And, but also we need to help workers uh, get a better understanding of the system and how the, it can be useful to them uh, for their rehabilitation. Um, so that, that that's a, a mistake to overlook that and imagine it's all going to sort itself out. But you can address it. And it does look like the general practitioners often put in that position as well of having to prove that their patient is busted in order to keep on gaining benefits or whatever it exactly. might be that they need. So That's exa Simon, exactly right, and that's hopeless. Absolutely. Now, Simon, you've said that uh, the GP can often be part of the problem rather than part of the solution. What sort of things do you think drive GPs to, well less than ideal management and what can we do about that well um <clears throat> i think um gps as i said we want to provide quick solutions uh people come to a gp with a problem and our job is there to fix their problem and with chronic pain unfortunately it's not a problem to be fixed just like that if we could have cured their their distress we would have done it a long time before and so that does make that whole uh, paradigm of uh, interaction um, 
a bit of a, a trouble. But uh, we still uh, keep saying, right, now let's look for something new. We'll do this test. We'll organise this injection. We'll try this new tablet. Um, maybe we'll put you on two opiates um, because there might be a better synergy. And, um, and after a while, they might move to a different general practice in the um, same practice, and the whole thing will go on again. And if all the uh, GPs who has been seeing this particular has been seeing Jerry in your practice have all been doing the same thing. It's a very brave GP that will say, "Look, you know, I'm going to change direction on the course of this patient uh, of this patient's care. I know that they've seen six pain clinics. I know that they've seen 20 GPs over 10 years, but I'm going to change the direction." And that's a pretty tough call for a, a GP. So there's this inertia. Uh, and our, our, um, our funding model uh, encourages to um, um, deal with um, the pain in that fashion because when they come in with their pain, they also have um, depression. They've probably sprained their ankle. Uh, they've got... Um, um, uh, we have to check their cholesterol and talk to them about this other thing. So there's so many other things going on. Sometimes it's a lot easier just to uh, do what the patient would like us to do and, um, and then focus on other things and get them out the door and uh, um, recognising that GPs are paid on a throughput basis. And I've seen it, re I've read it, that uh, any GP that's spending more than six minutes on their patients is not doing it uh, from an economical point of view. And Paul Jenkinson's pointed out in the question that you'd have to have long appointments for each of those five Appointments, is that something you would commit to, to give yourself time and to actually settle into the relationship? Look, I think um, we try to have double appointments for the first appointment, but that doesn't always happen. But I do think that you'd need to buy time for this guy, and this guy clearly needs time to unpick the very difficult, uh, complicated uh, biopsychosocial aspects that are going on here. If you didn't organise a few long appointments, uh, you would be you'd be uh, reckless. Um, and I think it'd be justifiable to the insurance company if they asked you. Sure. And one final question for you before we move to somebody else is: uh, we've got a question from Kulud who's asking about can or are you comfortable changing a client's psychiatric medication if a psychiatrist has prescribed it? Do you think? GP should overcome their inertia and change something that's been prescribed by a psychiatrist? Yeah, look, I don't want to make a categorical statement there, but I think we do have to at some times. And I think it's okay to um, contact a psychiatrist and say, you know, uh, is it a really good idea to have this person on two antipsychotics and three antidepressants plus some benzos? Um, could it be that we're actually causing problems um, and some psychiatrists are, um, it's a bit like the Wild West for psychopharmacology. I know psychiatrists often don't do psychotherapy anymore. That's for psychologists. But they do do pharmacopsychotherapy. Uh, and um, often they do very brave and courageous uh, combinations of um, psychoactive medications. I think it's quite okay to challenge a psychiatrist, if you like. I just like... Um, I think because we're all responsible for giving our best care. And we might, like the blind men and the elephant, we've got a different point of view. It's okay to say, you know, I don't think this is quite right. And uh, can we do it better? You might learn something. You might be, uh, you know, there's a new research out that I'm unaware of. Or it might be that the psychiatrist would like a bit of help because they're struggling with the fact that these um, starting to smoke dope and he's, uh, you know, been told that he uh, just needs another operation and, uh, the psychiatrist might not have an awful lot of chronic pain training and be uh, trying to assume that's biomedical too. Absolutely. So thank you for that. And going to Michael, um, I must confess I've just signed off three certificates over the weekend certifying patients as having no current work capacity and that that is likely to continue indefinitely. Uh, that's a hell of a thing to say about somebody, but it's what the more requires of us do you think and this is a question that Kate Ingold's asked about uh, whether we can use more positive language and whether your research is giving some early indications about how 
we should be, what sort of words we should be using in talking to people who do have uh, chronic pain, particularly work-related chronic pain? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I think um, I wouldn't say someone is totally incapacitated. Um, uh, and I, I've argued with the workers' comp people that they should ask doctors not just to make, make a medical diagnosis, but to identify the psychological and social contributors to this person's problems um, because they don't occur in isolation. And what uh, you need, to, I think you need to be doing is saying, at the moment, this, this guy is, is unable to work. But these are the things that could be done, be worked on, to help him or her get back to work uh, or suitable work. Um, so it's, um, it's acknowledging the, the problem, but secondly, uh, pointing to how it can be resolved. Because the consequence of saying a person is you know, totally cactus, <laughs> you know, it's, it's terrible. Um, that we know that being out of work is bad for your health, but both physical and psychological health. It's, um, it's a critical that as much as possible we get people back back to work. And to me, it's an, it's an emergency situation. Um, and we would throw resources at someone who's injured in a motor car accident on the highway, but for a worker, we're likely to toss them overboard. Uh, I think this is... Uh, a major mistake, and it's. I think we're doing a great disservice to people with these problems. Thank you for that. I fully agree. Uh, it does seem to be an adversarial system that uh, doesn't treat people for positive outcomes. Speaking of positive outcomes, there have been a number of questions also about comprehensive multidisciplinary pain clinics and their availability and uh, approaches. Do any of the panellists have any thoughts about uh, when we should be engaging with multidisciplinary pain clinics? Uh, Kat or, or Simon? Um, Simon here, can I say, um, I think um, these are a great idea, but um, don't seem to have a, a role in the vast majority of people with chronic pain. I understand the figures suggest that it's less than 0.2% of people with uh, chronic pain end up with uh, these multidisciplinary clinics. So they really are important, but for a, a minority of people. I, how, if I could flip it on its head, though, I think it really is important that we take a multidisciplinary approach to people's chronic pain. It might not be in a tertiary uh, um, multidisciplinary clinic, but it might be that, um, like Kat is um, a physio with cognitive skills, it might be that we are uh, doing some cross-discipline work. And uh, I think this is a really important thing for GPs to be doing. Um, a lot of the skills that we talk about in uh, chronic disease management are the sort of skills that we'd be wanting to, um, and strategies wanting to bring to bear with people with multidisciplinary clinics. Having said all that, I think it's really good that we've got multidisciplinary clinics for the minority of patients who need particular skills that we can't manage in primary care. Um, and um, very occasionally uh, I do send people that way. But often there's a long wait, 18 months, or they can't afford it, or being a rural GP, an addiction physician, it's often a long way away and people don't want to drive there because their back won't allow them to drive three hours to a clinic. Yeah, it's obviously, you know, it's wonderful that people can get access and, you know, Michael knows having worked in one for a long time now that uh, having the team all there uh, at the same time working in groups, which is another important thing about those clinics usually is that people are working in groups, which helps them to see others in the same situation and, in fact, generally helps them to get going a bit more. Um, it, it can take the focus away from them and their problem a little, but in primary care, it's actually really tough um, and it's hard to get access, uh, as Simon said. So what we've had to do in primary care is really create a network of um, you know, people that you know. So I'm always on the lookout for uh, psychologists and you know, I keep a little bit of a list of who there is that's available and what area they're in and who I can send to them. Um, and just getting to know people who are in your local area that do work in pain management um, or have those skills so that you can set up your own little network. 
Um, and as you say, communication is key. So using those, uh, you know, whatever method you can to get in touch with people and uh, keep each case going. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's Michael here, Stephen. I just wanted to say, as I work in a multidisciplinary pain centre, um, that's why I uh, thought I'd come to you last. But uh, yeah, yes, please yeah, go yeah. ahead, Michael. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, as Simon says, uh, only a small proportion can go, and that's understandable. If 20% of the population have chronic pain, um, we just don't have enough pain clinics to be able to do that. So what we've done is to actually create um, like a pyramid approach where the mass of people with chronic pain should uh, really have to be managed in the community. But the community means people who have got skills. And so that's the challenge for community health workers in primary care is to skill up to be able to do it because most of the courses available for their basic degrees do not provide them with the skills to manage chronic pain. So that's, that's the first task. And that's why it's becoming a specialization within the APA. So, um, but nevertheless, uh, there are people who um, will need a more um, intensive approach, and that's what pain clinics can offer um, if they are adequately resourced. And that's another problem because this is, comes under the state health departments and they're uh, always going to be strapped for cash uh, as well. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it's not expensive for the patients. As Simon said, it's costly. It's not, it's free. Patients can attend our program for free. Uh, it's a three-week program. They come every day, all day, Monday to Friday. Um, so uh, now, because of COVID, we've actually developed a uh, distance program. So we, we're able to treat people in Perth from Sydney using um, um, IT. Uh, and we've developed workbooks to work with our physios and psychologists and nurses and doctors. Um, from uh, from our from our clinic, we they don't even need to come down. So, COVID has meant that we don't the, the tyranny of distance is a thing of the past. We can actually provide, and we are providing. We're actually getting quite good results, working directly with people in remote communities, providing they have access to NBN. But if they don't have that, we can use a telephone um, uh, and the, and the mail to send them out materials. So I think a lot of things have changed because of COVID. And I think this is going to equip us much more effectively to be able to project multidisciplinary pain services uh, right across the country um, from uh, uh, places where the professionals exist and they can see people um, where, uh, without all the, you know, the previous problems. So uh, to me, the principles, though, are the same, whether they're in a clinic or whether they're in primary care. But in both cases, you need skilled practitioners, and that, that is the problem. Thanks for that, Michael. Certainly the NBN's giving us some headaches tonight, but I fully agree with you. It has uh, broken a lot of the uh, reliance on travel uh, and helped people in rural areas with chronic pain be able to get support without having to bump over roads for such a long distance. A few yeah. other questions to consider, and uh, Simon, I think it's back to you. Um, cannabis. Now, Jerry's found his way to a, a stash. What about medicinal cannabinoids? Do you see a role for them in chronic pain management? Uh, this is obviously a topic du jour. Um, <laughs> there's, been, there's been incredible excitement about um, these sort of substances for a long time. Uh, when when uh, pain physicians decided that opiates, we should be using medicinal opiates for uh, chronic pain, there was incredible excitement. It was likened to the uh, aeronautical equivalent of breaking the sound barrier, that we could finally give people opiates with, when they had chronic pain, uh, give them opiates without getting addicted. And uh, there's an incredible lot of excitement today about medicinal cannabis. Personally, I think that the excitement isn't coming from the doctors. It's coming from advocates who say, I use my cannabis because I can't sleep without cannabis. I use cannabis because I've got a bad back. It makes me feel better. Or I'm anxious. I can't go out and socialize without cannabis. Why should the fact that I use cannabis to relieve these psychological, physical problems make me a criminal? 
So there's advocacy. There's also a lot of commercial interest, less like opiates and the uh, the anti-epileptic use for pain, the gabapentinoids, have been really pushed by commercial interest. There's billions and billions and billions of dollars in this. And all the research is coming out of um, commercial sources. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting. I, I presented at a, the Australian Pain Society conference a couple of years ago, and one of the uh, pain physicians told me his stockbroker had advised him to buy lots of cannabis stock, and he was doing very well with them indeed. And uh, certainly from a commercial point of view, medicinal cannabis is fantastic. There's going to be lots of profit made. The research, which is all produced by um, uh, the pharmaceutical companies, is, um, is, indicates how wonderful it is. Uh, and I suspect um, um, we're, we're going into this with eyes wide, wide um, shut and we're forgetting what lessons that we had with the opiates. Um, it will take some time for us to work out what the role of opioids uh, of cannabis is. It might be that CBD has a role because it's not really an intoxicant. Um, on the other hand, it seems to me that the more stoned you are with CHC, the better your symptoms are and the more effective it is as a medicine. Um, we, we're going to have long-term problems that we're going to have to deal with. Who ha who's responsible for a traffic accident and someone who's using medicinal cannabis has? What happens if a young person gets schizophrenia? Uh, there's so many questions about this. What sort of medicinal cannabis are we using? Are we talking about uh, the stuff that you buy at the pub? Or are you talking about the um, stuff you buy in a pill or um, an oil? It's, it's all over the place. I think um, the dust will settle, and I think we will find a role for medicinal cannabis. My understanding, the meta-analyses show there's very little role for in chronic pain. The meta-analyses show that numbers needed to treat to get a 20, a 30% reduction in pain intensity is something like 24, and the numbers needed to treat to get a 50% reduction in pain with medicinal cannabis is uh, you can't actually find a confidence in interval for it. So um, I think it, watch this space. Uh, we need to be very cynical about the fact that we're, uh, the doctors are getting uh, where there's meat in the sandwich between the um, advocates for legalisation of cannabis and the commercial interests that want to make it compulsory. Thanks for that, Simon. And actually, there's been a number of people asking about where to find uh, colleagues with a particular focus in this area. Somebody, uh, Paul Grinsey, has asked if there's a pain-friendly health practitioner's directory anywhere. I don't know. Is there a pain association that would publish a list of everybody from pharmacists to uh, general practitioners who might be pain friendly or at least not judgmental or hopefully trained in the in the discipline? Could I say on this one, I, I think um, most GPs are snowed under with chronic pain. Um, we know that something like 20% of the population um, uh, report chronic pain on door-to-door -door surveys in many countries and uh, almost half of all GP consults the issue of pain is brought up at some point whether it's acute or chronic so I think we're all dealing with this um, as there certainly are um, I know Paul's been involved with work looking at um, people getting credential GPs getting credential for as, uh, pain uh, specialised uh, GPs and then hopefully there'll be some medical benefits schedule uh, remuneration about that um, but I think we're there needs to be lots of discussions about this and whether we need to have everybody upskilled or just have a handful of people who are uh, you know the, the go-to people the go-to GPs for people with chronic pain I think that needs that's still work in progress Thanks. Now, I've only got about 10 minutes remaining, so a few more questions. There have been a number of people asking about uh, trauma, uh, a past history of trauma as a sort of a setting event for the development of chronic pain. Michael, do you have any thoughts about that, evidence showing that you're seeing a... Please go ahead. I, I think there is some evidence like that, um, whether it's in childhood trauma or, or later or post-traumatic, uh, uh, you know, PTSD, uh, leading to uh, the experience of chronic pain. The, um, I think it also, trauma sort of sets the scene in a way for a person that sort of sensitizes them to, um, to 
to stressful situations and when you have an injury and your pain is persisting, they, they can certainly uh, uh, influence each other. So the arrows can go in both directions. Um, and certainly, if someone has chronic pain and has PTSD, for example, then you've got to treat both. Um, you can't expect just to treat one and the other will resolve. That's unlikely to happen. The same with uh, depression uh, and anxiety. Uh, these things often do go together. Uh, the major um, more than 50% of people presenting with chronic pain will be depressed, but also many will have anxiety. And uh, uh, it is there is evidence that a, a, the history of trauma can um, uh, make it make you more vulnerable to the development of chronic disabling pain. Um, we can't always predict who will get it. Um, there's a uh, we're not the science isn't that good yet, but certainly it makes it more likely that you're at risk of developing chronic pain with that sort of uh, background. Thank you, and I can't move to the final section without thinking about Helen Bufton's question about the role of animals in helping ameliorate chronic pain. We did have a number of questions before the webinar about uh, everything from equinotherapy, horses through to dogs. Uh, does anybody have any thoughts about those sorts of approaches? I, I would say the, thing, the point here really to me is it doesn't have to be uh, an animal. Uh, could be an, an inanimate object, if you like, whatever your preference. But um, uh, I think if you can engage in something that gives your life meaning uh, and is important to you, uh, you will suffer less. One of the pioneers in the United States he had a great say, I remember, because I met, met with him a long time ago, um, he said that uh, um, folks who have got something better to do don't suffer as much. So if you've got a way of uh, improving your mood, of uh, giving yourself some satisfaction, enjoyment, pleasure, um, then that will uh, minimise your pain and make you more functional. So um, it is; uh, it doesn't have to be a pet, uh, but it can be. I just see it as something that uh, is very individual. Um, but it's very important to look for that in trying to work with a person to look at what pleasurable things they would like to do that they can do and encourage them to do that, just like you do with people who are depressed. Um, it's not just a matter of taking antidepressants and waiting two weeks to see if there's a benefit. You can get on with this straight away. So I, 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 can, imagine, I can imagine that would be especially important with children with chronic pain, thinking about things like juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and those sorts of things. Our yes. final question, any quick comments about the approach to children? We've talked about this 56-year-old man. Uh, we haven't talked about older people, but what about children? How do we approach them with chronic pain? It's a whole new weather now. The principles are the same. The principles are exactly the same. But what you've got there also are the parents. Just like with uh, Jerry, with the worker, with the workplace, um, with children, you've got the parents. And so the there's a great uh, ch uh, child psychologist and uh, uh, children's uh, or pediatric pain clinics in Australia, and they they all their characteristic is they en engage the family in working with the child with pain. So uh, that that's uh, it's, it's not a matter of sort of thinking of the drug or the right injection or something. It is a matter of understanding the child's uh, within the context of their family and working in a collaborative way. Well, thanks indeed for that, Michael. Now, our technical team is absolutely fascinated by you turning pink there. We're not sure if it's some Instagram filter you've chosen or you're just going the full Warhol, but you look very top psychedelic, so I guess <laughs> I think something I wasn't expecting to have tonight. Let's just have a final <laughs> word, though. Kat, what's your final word before we, we finish up? Look, I mean, in cases like this, for us as physical therapists or definitely centred towards the physical being, um, working with mental health practitioners is so important and so useful for us. So, you know, we love chatting to you about it and any chance we can to work with you is always great. And 
I'm always encouraging junior physios to go and look out for someone to go and sit in with or just go and have a chat with. So if anyone does approach you, it would be very helpful <laughs> to let them do a bit of work with you and to teach them um, how you work so that we can work better. Fabulous. And a final word from Simon Holliday. I think it's been a really great session. I've learned heaps from everybody. And uh, thank you uh, to my co-presenters and people for coming along. I think everybody deals with pain and chronic pain. And it, it doesn't have to be a heart sink. We can do our best for people. Quite often um, by thinking broadly rather than trying to look for a, a quick fix, we will be ta um, taking the best approach for the person. That might well be we need to be doing collaborative care, with our colleagues uh, quite often who haven't got pain skilling, but we don't know how much pain training you need to give excellent care. There's nobody's done a study that you need to do what the dose of um, pain training is. Is it one hour? Is it uh, a six year master's degree? Who knows what? But if we all um, do better pain care after training and understanding the, broad, the broadness of uh, how uh, pain is experienced, and how we can take a broad multidisciplinary approach or multimodal approach, I think we'll be looking after our patients a lot better. Great. Thanks for that. And Simon, oh, sorry, uh, Michael, maybe one for you. There has also been questions about uh, mindfulness. I would imagine yep. that might fit into the group of uh, approaches that really suit some people who are committed to it. Yes, yes, that, that's that's right. And an answer just briefly to Simon's uh, last point about how long the training should be. You train until you're competent, and we can measure that. Um, in terms of mindfulness, uh, it, it's like relaxation or yoga, uh, all those sorts of strategies, uh, Tai Chi, they, they are very useful strategies to use. They're not enough by themselves, but they do help to engender a more positive affect or feelings, um, calmness and if you can stay calm in the presence of pain you'll suffer less and so that it is worth uh, equipping yourself to do that or to teach it or uh, there are websites that offer these things so yes uh, but it's not the mindfulness per se the technique it is uh, relaxation strategies um, can achieve very the same sort of results but the key thing is the patient has to do it and that's the thing that comes through all chronic pain management it's actually got to be self-management by the patient. And that's what we must all be doing because we don't have a magic pill. But we can help people to learn to manage it. And that and mindfulness is one of the strategies that can be very useful. Great. All right. Well, thank you for that. It's time now for us to finish up. And I'll just uh, a few things to close. First of all, obviously, to thank our panellists so much for uh, sharing your expertise with us tonight. Also, the participants who have been so active, that's been uh, incredibly helpful. There's a few things to get people to do before you leave us, please. That's the exit survey. Please provide us with feedback, always looking to improve these webinars, so we'd appreciate your thoughts. There's a survey icon at the top right of the screen. If you fill out the survey or just wait for it to pop up when we finish. You will receive follow-up communication from MHPN with the recording of this activity, how to access it if you have had NBN problems. Uh, there's another webinar coming up pretty shortly, actually, on emerging minds, which is about engaging fathers and their children. That's on the 29th of October, so not far away at all. <clears throat> and also a collaborative approach to working with children affected with grief, uh, which is on the 10th of December. Also, MHPN has launched its inaugural podcast, MHPN Presents, that explores well-being and mental health, uh, which would cover some of the issues related to mindfulness uh, as a lifestyle as well. You'll find that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the MHPN website. If you want to stay up tonight, uh, up to date for fortnightly episodes, please do subscribe by going on to the MHPN website. Also, at a local level, uh, if you want to keep on talking about this topic and others, uh, please uh, do get in touch with your project officer at your local MHPN network uh, across metropolitan, regional, rural and remote Australia. 373 networks around the country. So there's an online map on site where you can see who's close to you uh, and also uh, to contact Jackie at networks at mhpn.org.au. 
so that will answer some questions people had about accessing uh, colleagues in their area. Also, as with COVID-19 is having an effect on NHPN as well, there are Zoom meetings available. So before we close, I would like to acknowledge uh, people who have been with us tonight and uh, uh, those that you care for, uh, people who are living with mental illness and pain in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness uh, in the present. So thank you, everybody, for your participation and I wish you a very good evening. Thank you all.